Welcome to the AAAS Brain Briefing on Neurotechnology and the Military. I'm Erin Heath, Associate Director of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. AAAS is the world's largest general scientific society, and we're dedicated to the advancement of scientific knowledge for the good of society as a whole. This series is funded by the Dana Foundation. The Dana Foundation is a philanthropic organization that supports brain research through grants and educates the public about the successes and potential of brain research. We are very thankful for their support for the past seven years. Also, a shout out to my colleagues, Chloe McPherson and Nicole Rutledge, who helped plan this event. And finally, thanks go to the members and staff of the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus for their support. We have two fantastic speakers today. I'll turn it over first to Dr. Jonathan Moreno. Dr. Moreno is a Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor, the David and Lynn Silfen Professor, and Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy of History and Sociology of Science and of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Moreno. Thank you. And now here's where I try to figure out how to switch sides. So we have all these advanced degrees trying to figure out how to do this. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here, happy to give you another free lunch. Uh, Dr. Hochberg and I did the first series uh, in, this, uh, in this series, uh, I think, six years ago. Um, so uh, you owe me. Uh, so I'm going to talk just for about 10 minutes about uh, military neuroenhancement. Um, I, I should say that I am not a scientist, as you heard. I'm, I'm actually a philosopher by training. I teach history of science uh, and medical ethics at Penn. Um, and my special interest really is... Um, trying to follow what's going on in the culture about these issues, as, and, and then uh, following the people who actually do the real work, um, like Dr. Hochberg. Um, so um, we are in, as you know, the era of big neuroscience. We've got the, uh, the Brain Initiative in the US, which is actually now also giving out neuroethics grants uh, uh, out of NIH uh, to look at some of the moral implications, ethical, legal, and social implications of neuroscience. And of course, um, the Human Brain Project in uh, the EU, um, which has a, a much more ambitious goal, uh, according to at least the director, uh, and which is to, stim to simulate the human brain. I guess we stimulate, they simulate. Uh, and um, you know, I don't know that anybody really knows what simulating the human brain means, but as a Supreme Court justice once said about something else, I guess we'll know it when we see it. So what, what's driving the US effort in particular is the fact that there's really so little in the pipeline for um, some of the most serious uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders. Um, I'm, I'm going to go so far as to say that what people like Dr. Hochberg are doing on, in the, on the uh, hard neuroscience, neurology side, is in a way more successful than what we've got for people who have um, delusional disorders like schizophrenia and psychosis. We really, really don't know what to do for those people. And a lot of this is driven also by, by PTSD uh, from uh, people who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. About two-thirds of them, as you may know, fail talk therapy uh, and, and drug therapy. So I'm sorry, one-third of them fail talk therapy and drug therapy. So people are looking in all sorts of new directions, uh, and in some cases old directions, for taking care of the other third. Um, there's actually quite a bit of work being done in, in military uh, in, uh, agencies concerning uh, neuroscience. Uh, this, this, uh, these numbers were put together by my friend and colleague at Georgia Tech, as you can say, this is back from 2011. I asked her if she would do this again for me, uh, and she said, not in your life. It was too hard going through the federal budget and trying to figure this out. But um, this gives you some idea of what, uh, of the, and this is only cognitive neuroscience. This is not even the hard stuff that doc, some of which Dr. Hochberg will, will talk to you about. Um, to bring it a little more up to date, unsystematically, I did pull off a few months ago some of the programs in the DOD that are relevant, modeling human behavior, uh, neurocognitive computational models, and um, what's particularly cool, uh, direct neural interfacing. This stuff really is beginning to slough over into the science fiction that I read uh, when I was little, um, bef bef when they were, we were just using stone tablets uh, for books. Uh, so um, some of this, those of you in the room who work on national security issues may have heard about the, the phrase, the third offset. So the third offset strategy, I think it was first articulated by um, Secretary Hagel, uh, maybe five years ago. That's um, um, four or five years ago. And um, what 
the idea, the, the idea of an offset is what gives us asymmetric strategic advantage, right? So um, th this is the off. Th this was the uh, this is the offset now. The first offset was the bomb. The second offset was, um, which obviously is not only ours anymore, um, the and wasn't since the early 1950s. The second offset was targeted munitions, approximately used during Desert Storm Desert Shield in the in the early 90s, uh, and the third offset is this list. It's a pretty scattered list, but what I found so interesting when I saw this was that they, all of these items conceivably have something to do with neuroscience, learning about neural networks, learning about how the brain works, applying that information to robotics, to digesting data, to miniaturization, the kind of thing that, again, uh, Lee is going to talk to you about. Um, so I, I did, this is my advertisement. I did publish, because I'm not going to get a lunch. I did publish a book about this called Mind Wars. Um, Five, this is the paperback from five years ago. Really desperately needs to be updated. If anybody in the room wants to get me a contract, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, um, I, I hope you appreciate the visual pun. Uh, I did not come up with it. My wife thinks it looks like a maple syrup dispenser, but <laughs> she's a lawyer, so does she know. So um, a point that I'd like to make when I give these talks, though, is it's kind of a history of science point. Uh, every generation has been trying to figure out how to use a a, a brain-related technology in, an, in a way that could help national security. And I'm going to show you just briefly my favorite example from the 1980s, um, ideas that came out of the 60s and 70s. So this is, a, this is a passage from a National Academy of Sciences report, National Research Council report, in 1988 on, called Enhancing Human Performance. And that what they were worried about at that time was the mind race. I know you can, you can this is the mind race with the Soviet Union, 1988. I know you can read English, but I just love to read this out loud. The claimed phenomena and applications presented by several military officers range from the incredible to the outrageously incredible. The anti-missile time warp, for example, is somehow supposed to deflect attack from nuclear warheads. Don't tell the rocket man about this. Uh, so that they will transcend time and explode among the ancient dinosaurs. Now, time out. I read all the science fiction when I was a kid. I read Philip K. Dick and Heinlein, all these guys. And I know that if you go back in time and like step on a butterfly, when you come back, everything will be different, right? So for sure, if you blow up some dinosaurs, that's really bad for us, okay? So uh, uh, the generals were not reading the same stories I was reading, apparently. Uh, one suggested application is a conception of the first Earth Battalion made up of warrior monks including the use of ESP, leaving their bodies at will, levitating, psychic healing, and walking through walls. Now, I don't have a, an actual documentary footage of the warrior monks, but there was a film that pretty much shows you what it was like. You have to be very quiet because... K-9. Volume's not good. Scotty. It's... Uh, it's something cylindrical. It's a pencil. Okay. Larry. This is Larry's spirit guide, Maud. I'm looking into the cupboard now, and I see, I see a tin mug. Lynn? It's a man sitting in a chair. No, wait a minute. You said A, not K. He said A. Bravo, Zulu, Len. Outstanding. So a young British journalist got hold of that report that I gave, read you the paragraph from, and he wrote a book called The Men Who Stared Goats. George Clooney made it into a movie. I just showed you the best scene in the movie, so you don't need to, to watch it. But the, the point is that it, uh, every technology is potentially dual use. Right? Prometheus got fire. Uh, then we got flamethrowers, you know, got millennia later. So there's always... Uh, the dual use aspect to all these technologies. But we are talking about exposing mostly young people, war fighters, to these new technologies at some point. There's always a first user, so how do you do that? Um, this is a very summary slide that I spend, could spend a, a semester on uh, in one of my classes, you're welcome to show up, um, about, the about how medical and military ethics operates with respect to war fighters and experiments. And basically, when it comes to being fit for duty, they can't decline anything. 
if there's a standard, for example, the commander wants you to get on your anthrax vaccine, you're going to take your anthrax vaccine. End of story. It's, it's, uh, it's something that um, we sort of know about, even though it may only be investigational. That is to say, maybe that anthrax vaccine only is known to work for uh, cutaneous anthrax, like wool handler's disease. But if it's 1991, 1992, and you're about to in invade Kuwait City, and the commander says, we don't know if it's going to work for inhalation anthrax, but you're going to take it. You're going to take it. That's an investigational drug. Uh, and, and that's something that, that the commander has the right to require to use if he thinks it keeps uh, you fit for duty and helping your brothers and sisters in uniform. But if it's experimental, that is to say, if it's something that, for which there's really no evidence that's, that's relevant, that's a different story. And that requires a higher level. I don't expect you to read all these things in two seconds, but that requires a higher level of, uh, of ethical standard, including uh, full informed consent, including not having a person of higher rank in the room when you're being consented to make sure it's really voluntary and so forth. Now, when we get to enhancement, I'm doing this really quickly for reasons of time because I want to play another movie. Um, for, uh, when we get to enhancement, things are much harder. The FDA right now is trying to figure out what to do with it with its, its jurisdiction over enhancing medications, enhancing devices. Uh, and so this is really a new area. One example we do have for cognitive and neurocognitive enhancement, by the way, there's really very little new under the sun with respect to making a warfighter or anybody else more alert uh, or smarter. Very little. We've been at this for a long time. I've been following it for a long time. There's very little new under the sun. However, a drug called uh, modafinil, which was approved in the mid-1980s uh, for people who have sleep disorders, narcolepsy, um, was approved by, I think it was 2004, by the Air Force for pilot's use along with speed, the go pills. So there are new go pills. Uh, by the way, if you don't know about modafinil, um, you probably will want to after I tell you that the NIH has found that it can keep you awake and alert for up 60 to 80 hours with no measurable decrease of concentration. Uh, so, uh, or uh, you can still pass the, uh, the exams, that, the stupid exams that they give you to see how alert you are. So yeah, all my first year medical students run out uh, and try to find where they can get some modafinil um, after they hear that. But it's also being used by long haul truck drivers, uh, by my colleagues, uh, See, Lee, next time you have to go to China and do a quick turnaround in a night or two, to give a paper. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever used it, but, uh, well, this is your, this is your big chance. Um, on the other side, there are, we, because of post-traumatic stress disorder, there, there are ideas that maybe you could use beta blockers to prevent PTSD. Uh, could, could, maybe you could give it to people uh, prophylactically before they're in a traumatic situation. It, some evidence, although I think it's modest at best, that... Um, that it's helpful therapeutically after a trauma. Uh, but what you, you have this then this inter interesting ethical dilemma, which we could talk about in an ethics seminar endlessly. Um, would the trade off of preventing a, a, a PTSD, a terrible disease, for a lifetime uh, be worth having a cohort of, of warfighters who came back and didn't feel guilt or regret or shame about what they had seen or what they had had to do? So now we get a little more into the brain imaging area I'll just, uh, and, and the stuff that you can do to the brain and information you get out of the brain. Uh, this is a, an old New Yorker cartoon that has only become more relevant. This is two very nervous parents standing in front of a teacher who's saying, we found by applying just the tiniest bit of an electric shock, test scores have soared. Now this is probably 20, 25 years old. Well, that's exactly what people claim they can do with uh, TD TDCS or TMS. Uh, actually, it's being used with some success uh, that my psychiatrist colleagues tell me uh, instead of ECT or if people fail ECT and they have chronic depression. Uh, TMS may be the wave of the future, although it's been the wave of the future for at least 10 years, as far as I can tell, for chronic depression. Uh, but it, it, it can also be used to make you think you've experienced things you haven't experienced or seen things you haven't seen. For example, in this experiment, um, subjects who thought they were looking at that uh, bush on the upper left got, got some, uh, some, some TDCS uh, prefrontally, and then they, they, were, they thought that they had seen that green bush on the right. So you can do this. You can also make yourself smarter. I know people who work on the Hill want to be smart, so you could zap yourself. All you need, really, is a couple of 9-volt. There's a 9-volt nine, battery. Uh, and some electrodes and some wires. You put it on your forehead, and you can do do-it-yourself TDCS like these idiots do, who write about it on the internet. 
Um, and there, there's serious work going on at places like the Beckman Institute about the implications of TMS and TDCS for in, improving concentration, alertness, and so forth. Now, warfighters generally um, still, although they have all, all kinds of fancy equipment, they still often, in order to work with colleagues, have to do this. Um, so instead of doing this, maybe what you could do is somehow get people to talk to each other wirelessly. Here we go back to the science fiction. But it's not entirely science fiction. This is a piece by a, a, a colleague at Penn who uh, is an assistant professor who has been working with a colleague at uh, Duke named Nicolilis, uh, who is working on getting monkeys to talk to each other, to work to coordinate with each other, even though they don't know what they're doing, uh, using something, so chronically, chronic implants with wires in their heads. So here's the thing. There's one uh, monkey that has control over uh, the red ball, the other has control over the blue ball, uh, and they're, what they're trying to do without, it, it, and getting um, shots of juice as a reward is get that little black ball inside the circle. Right? So they are cooperating in some sense. They don't necessarily know what they're doing. What they do know is that when they think a certain way, they get a shot of juice. Or when they, uh, do monkeys think, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, this is the deep philosophical question, but whatever they're doing, they're cooperating. Now, the interesting question, which I've asked um, my colleague Arjun, is, well, that, that's, this is neuromuscular neurons, right? This is kind of, this is not all that interesting, is it? He said, uh, what about thought? You know, what about thoughts, like thinking about, you know, philosophy? And he said, well, it's just an engineering problem, giving me the principles, and I'm sure I can do it, and the money. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So um, can we go beyond the kind of implants that people are using, like Dr. Hochberg in, in, his, in his patient subjects to help them interact? I'll let him talk more about this little, little, little um, advance warning about Dr. Hochberg's talk. Can we go beyond these kinds of, uh, these kinds of implants with chronic wires? Uh, can we actually have better and better chips that will allow you to uh, talk to people, perhaps, with hun maybe hundreds or hundreds of thousands of bioelectrodes? Would it be possible? for one warfighter to communicate with another warfighter wordlessly, soundlessly, instantly, um, almost like telepathy. Well, DARPA is kind of interested in that. They don't quite tell you that if you go on their website to talk about this project. But if you talk to them, they'll say, you know, we don't really know what could happen if you've got hundreds of thousands of microelectrodes in a chip. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. And it's not only DARPA, but also the Navy's uh, working on questions of computational neuroscience. Um, now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, what are the rules and regulations? Well, there's international law. Um, we don't really care much about international law in the United States, but when I go to Europe, people talk about it all the time. It's a, whole, it's a revelation. Um, there are human rights laws, including in medical ethics, uh, human research ethics, the Declaration of Helsinki. There are humanitarian laws. There's the, the disarmament conventions. In fact, the OPCW, the Organization for, for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, is meeting today. And neuroscience-based uh, neuroscience weapons are on the agenda for the OPCW. Don't hold your breath. Um, at least, uh, if not the law, what about the ethics? Do we need new ethical principles? Should uh, cognitive liberty, should I be the only one who decides uh, who has access to my thoughts? Um, must everything that's done to me be reversible, particularly if I'm in an experiment? Um, for those of you who have insomnia, um, you can read some of the National Research Council reports that uh, do not talk about the warrior monks. Don't get excited. Um, but this is a group I was part of in 2008. Uh, this is all on the National Academy's press. Interestingly, the client for this was the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, which is, and this is almost 10 years later. You can go and look at it and see how much of this actually has come to pass. Uh, at the same time, the NRC also had a committee from the, looking at um, opportunities for the Army in neuroscience. Um, four years ago, I was part of this group, also National Academies, on the ethical, legal, social issues for what we called emerging and readily available technologies. In other words, this is stuff that, that a, a small state or a non-state actor might get access to. Not only um, putting fu funny stuff on your Facebook page, uh, but um, also perhaps being able to figure out how, in some detail, how it affects your brain when they put that stuff on the Facebook page. So I'm going to leave it at that and uh, look forward to uh, hearing an update for the last six years from Lee Hochberg and talk later. Thank you.